welcome to this class on the 1931 Dracula movie. This is both a standalone class on this movie, starring Bela Lugosi and directed by Todd Browning, and it is also the bonus ninth week of an eight-week-long course on Dracula by Bram Stoker that I offer through Clockworks Academy. You can find out more about all the courses that I offer at clockworksacademy.com, the Dracula course is starting again soon. I also offer a werewolves course beginning soon. I am Dr. Paul Moffat. I have a PhD in medieval literature. And so in all of these lectures and classes on movies, I am looking at the movies through a literary perspective. That is my expertise and my focus. I've talked already in some of my previous videos about adaptation, so check out my video on the 1931 Frankenstein movie starring Boris Karloff, and the 1935 Bride of Frankenstein also starring Boris Karloff. In both of those videos I talk about the movie, but I also talk about adaptation theory and monster theory in ways that I'm going to try not to replicate for this class. So let's talk a little bit about adaptation. The 1931 Dracula movie, of course, is an adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula, and also the play, Dracula, by Hamilton Dean and John Balderston. And in fact, you can see in the credits here that Bram Stoker's name is certainly listed, but the, there's not any clarity in the credits that that there's a novel by Bram Stoker. The credits say Dracula by Bram Stoker, adapted by, etc. And this movie is much more directly based on the play than it is on the novel. The play was written, as the credits say, by Hamilton Dean. This is him. And John Balderston. Hamilton Dean was an actor. He worked in the Henry... He was an English actor. He was uh, part of the Henry Irving theater troupe, and if you've been a part of my course on Dracula the novel, you'll know that Bram Stoker was Henry Irving's manager. So I don't know if Dean knew Stoker, but he certainly was in the same social circle. Hamilton Dean was not a writer, he was not a playwright, he was an actor. He is known as a playwright only for his play Dracula, which he wrote while he was sick. He was in bed with a bedridden with the flu or something and just was inspired to adapt Dracula into a play. The English play Dracula by Hamilton Dean was fairly successful and successful enough to be brought to America. And when it was brought to America, uh, it was adapted for American audiences by John Balderston. John Balderston was a professional playwright and screenwriter for his entire career. He has a very long list of credits. He changed the Hamilton Dean script quite a lot. So the structure of the story comes from Dean, but the dialogue comes from Balderston. So they didn't work on it together. It, they're credited as Hamilton Dean and John Balderston, but Balderston got Dean's play, got permission from the got uh, rights to adapt it and did changing quite a lot in the process and then it was a, when it was adapted into a movie they got equal billing as they had gotten in america the other thing to know about balderston that is just a uh curiosity the other bit of trivia about balderston worth knowing is that he also co-wrote the play upon which frankenstein was based he went on to write the screenplay for The Mummy, and continued to write plays and screenplays until his death in 1954. Now, if we're going to talk about adaptation and Dracula, we're already, you can already see how it is not straightforward. We have a movie adapted from a play, itself adapted from another play, adapted from a novel, and there are other things that come into our understanding of this movie other than where it came from. And so I want to talk about adaptation, but I kind of want to broaden it as I did in my conversation about The Bride of Frankenstein. You can watch that video if you would like. And talk about 
intertextuality in general and how texts relate to each other, whether they are direct adaptations or not. And to do that for today, I want to talk about another literary theorist, and that's Roland Barthes. I talked about Julia Kristeva in my Bride of Frankenstein video. Barthes was Kristeva's teacher and mentor. And he wrote in his book SZ, he wrote that the goal of literary work, of literature as work, is to make the reader no longer a consumer, but a producer of the text. And also, he said, the text is a galaxy of signifiers, not a structure of signifieds. Both of those are different ways of saying that, according to Barthes, the reader creates the meaning of the text. And that is something that Kristeva says also. Barthes says it much more emphatically. Barthes puts the emphasis on the reader much more uh, emphatically than Kristeva does. And Barthes says, the meaning of the text comes from the reader. The reader is the person who creates the text. The reader is the author of the text. And he's well known for another of his essays, The Death of the Author. I'm not going to go into it today, but the same general idea comes up in SZ, that the reader understands things, brings their interpretations in. That's what the text is. It's the meaning created by the reader. What that means, the idea of a galaxy of signifiers, not a structure of signifieds. Signifier, this is, these are terms that come to us from Saussure, who's a linguist. And the idea of a signifier is what points to meaning, and signified is the meaning that's pointed to. So Barthes says, a text is a galaxy of signifiers. What it means depends on the reader and how the reader interprets them. It's not a structure of signifieds. It's not a bunch of meanings put together in a strict way that the reader decodes. It's a galaxy of things that point to a meaning, and what meaning they point to depends on how the reader interprets them. So in the context of Dracula, we can say that uh, this movie that starring Bela Lugosi has meaning that comes both from the movie itself and also from whatever we may know or assume about the novel by Bram Stoker. It also has meaning that comes to it from the 1922 silent film Nosferatu, which maybe I'll talk about someday in the future. It's a definitely uh, has had a huge influence on vampire stories. But this movie also has meaning that we bring to it if we know Sesame Street's Count. Greetings, I am the Count. If we know Count Chocula. If we know the 1992 Bram Stoker's Dracula. And I never drink wine. That line, I never drink wine, that's not from the novel, it is from this movie. And if you saw the 1992 Bram Stoker's Dracula before you saw this movie, then as far as you creating the meaning of the movie, th this is a response to that, not the other way around. Because the order that it happens chronologically in history is less important for the meaning of the text than an order that the order of your interpretation as the reader. So part of the result and part of the purpose of getting a historical context, hearing the background and what was happening and where these all came from, that's not to reveal the meaning of the text to you. That creates a new meaning for the text. Because if you, the reader, and when I say reader, watching a movie is reading metaphorically, it's interpreting. If you, the reader, bring that meaning in when you watch the movie, then the movie means something different to you, and therefore it is a different text. You're, you're adapting it by watching it. With that said, in my videos on Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, I talked a lot about the silent film tradition that informs James Whale as a director in making those movies. We will see as we look at Dracula, and maybe it already has struck you watching Dracula, the tradition that 
Todd Browning is reproducing, is referencing here in Dracula is more a stage tradition than a silent film tradition. This is less a silent film with voices added than a play with a camera. With some major exceptions, and we'll talk about those, but you can think of it. It explains some of the things about how this film is produced, if you think of it as an adaptation of the play. Let's talk a little bit about vampires. What kind of a monster is a vampire? I'm taking my... I'm going to use as my starting point a book, the vampire film Undead Cinema by Jeffrey Weinstock. This is him. And Jeffrey Weinstock is building a lot on Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's monster theory, which I talked about in my Bride of Frankenstein class. They worked at the time at the same university, so they knew each other, colleagues in in person. Weinstock presents seven principles of vampires on film. I'm not going to go over all seven of them. I don't think all seven are especially important for the 1931 Dracula, but two of them I really want to pay attention to. One is the cinematic vampire is an overdetermined body condensing what a culture considers other. And there's a lot in that statement, but we can notice in 1931 Dracula how Bela Lugosi's Dracula is well known for his thick accent. I am Dracula. We talked in my course on the Dracula novel. We talked about why it matters that Dracula is a foreigner. And the movie plays the foreignness of Dracula up very much by having Bela Lugosi speak in that thick accent. There's also a uh, two other aspects of Bela Lugosi's Dracula that represent a kind of otherness in a very strong and culturally specific way in the 1930s. And the first is, as a count, this is also something that is present in the novel. This is also something I talked about in my course on the novel. But remember the historical context This movie changes the setting of Dracula from the end of the Victorian era into the present of the movie. That is the late 20s, early 30s. We see cars driving around, for example. So it is set near the beginning of the Great Depression in the real world context of the beginning of the Great Depression. And we have the Count as a sophisticated European dressed in a tuxedo, walking around with a top hat, who... Anyway, we will get more to that. I'm going to come back to exactly what I just stopped myself from saying in a second. He represents a kind of economic and class-based other, as well as a nationalistic other. That He's a foreigner from continental Europe coming to London and symbolically coming to America because the audience of this movie is American. And notice how, for example, Dwight Fry's Renfield. But wait! Dwight Fry is an American actor. I mean, just a minute. He is essentially doing an American accent, perhaps with a little bit of a touch of of suggestion of Englishness, but not a very strong one. So this is London, but it's also a representation of America. The other of Weinstock's principles of the cinematic vampire that I want to draw attention to is, he says, the vampire always returns. And this is a play on Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's idea, the, the monster always escapes. I think in the context of vampires, it is especially compelling, as Weinstock phrases it here, that the monster always returns, not just escapes. Vampires are returned monsters to begin with. Even before the movie starts, the fact that it's a vampire means it's a creature that has returned. They are undead. They should be dead, but they have returned. Weinstock has two corollary or or sub-points connected to the idea that the vampire always returns. One is that the vampire begins at home. That the vampire returns because it's coming back to where it started from. And this is tied 
right to what we already said about how the vampire is a the vampire's body is a condensation of what the culture considers other. That is, the vampire's otherness is defined by what a specific culture perceives as other. So vampirism begins at home in a symbolic sense that we can only recognize and define things as other if we're starting where we are. And also vampirism begins at home in a literal sense that long, I mean, it's a, it's a central part of vampire folklore that vampires begin by attacking their family. We have throughout the 1931 Dracula movie, Dracula's attack on Mina is all about being in her home. They represent Mina as being already there. The vampire's already in the house and coming out of the home. Also, it begins in Dracula's home. So what we see in this beginning with Dwight Fry's Renfield coming to Dracula is instead of the monster starting by leaving where he is and, and attacking elsewhere, it begins with someone coming into the monster's home. So the vampire starts at home, England comes to him, and from there he moves on. The other corollary that uh, Weinstock suggests that goes along with the idea that the vampire other always returns is kind of the opposite, that although the vampirism starts at home, the vampire always appears to come from elsewhere. And this is something we already I already mentioned briefly about why it matters so much that Bela Lugosi is so clearly marked as foreign, that although it starts with him at home, and although his attack is on Mina's home, there's also a sense that he has come, he seems to have come from elsewhere, he's recognizably from elsewhere, that's an aspect of vampires on film, not just in this film. And it's tied to the idea of the vampire always returns, because the vampire seems to come from elsewhere, and yet he's bringing otherness and foreignness into the place where the heroes, where the good guys live. And then the final thing that I don't think I'm going to go into much, because I talk about it in my Bride of Frankenstein video, is the idea that the monster always escapes. That at the end of this movie, we don't actually see Dracula die. He dies off screen. We'll come back to that. Why that matters. So I have already started to do it. Let's do, uh, actually directly shift and talk about Dracula 1931 instead of vampires in general. And the place I want to start with talking about Dracula 1931 is by talking about Bela Lugosi. I bid you welcome. This is a complicated movie in terms of its success, in terms of how successful it is as a movie, in terms of how effective it is as a movie. I would claim very strongly that the success of this movie in financial terms, in terms of popularity, is entirely dependent on Bela Lugosi, his performance, his personal charisma. He is uh, at the center of this movie. There's some other moments that we'll get to, some other aspects. I think Dwight Fry's performance as Renfield is also uh, justifiably memorable. <laughs> but Bela Lugosi is the central figure of this movie, and this movie succeeds because of Bela Lugosi. And he does a number of things in this performance that change our idea of what Dracula is, of what vampires are. And one of them, I've already mentioned, the thick accent. I said earlier that Bela Lugosi performs this in a thick accent. That may be a little misleading, because it is not that Bela Lugosi puts on a thick accent in order to perform this role. This is his natural accent. This is his natural voice. In fact, Bela Lugosi's English was not very good. He performed in the stage version of Dracula in the American, the stage version that was very financially successful, that was very popular. And 
While he was performing as Dracula on stage, he didn't speak English. He learned the role of Dracula. He learned his lines phonetically. And he's even reported as saying he doesn't really under didn't really understand why other European actors bothered learning English. Because you can just learn phonetically. And that just it adds another layer both to comprehending his charisma and also to the tragedy behind his career. He was starting to learn English when the movie Dracula happened, so he did speak some English. He was uh, reportedly very eccentric on the set, didn't talk to the other actors, and they thought that he was egotistical and eccentric, and it's probably partly that he was, but partly that he didn't really trust his weak English to talk and chit-chat. So the performance of foreignness that Bela Lugosi gives is informed by his own alienation in Hollywood. And the performance of otherness that he gives in this movie is both compelling and is simultaneously compelling and a source of power for him. We can see moments when the uh, camera is drawn into Bela Lugosi's face symbolically we the audience are drawn into Bela Lugosi's performance and he has this enormous as I said personal charisma reportedly in his life he was a magnetic person especially in his youth and he before he started being Dracula he mostly played romantic leads and he was known for being handsome and suave and uh very compelling. And if you forget for a moment that you think of him as a caricature of Dracula, he was very good looking, and in a very striking way. But all of that at the same time, his otherness, his foreignness that he brings into Dracula are representations of his actual otherness in Hollywood, that the Hollywood system, the Universal Studios, uh, manipulated to weaken him. And part of the story of 1931 Dracula is steeped in tragedy in a number of ways, and one of those tragedies is a professional tragedy for Bela Lugosi. Because this movie made his career and also ended it. He had been the star of Dracula on stage, and star in the most fullest way. I think that on stage as well as in the movie, the stage show succeeded because of him, because of his personal charisma, which is completely appropriate for Dracula as a character who is hypnotic, who is able to control the people around him. They are drawn to him, although they don't know how or why. That all is partly true of Bela Lugosi himself, especially at this point in his life. But he made his desire to play Dracula very public. He wrote public letters. He worked on behalf of the studio to get the rights to the movie because he knew Florence Stoker but through playing the lead in the play. And he did all this very publicly in the hopes that his public magnanimity would be returned in kind by the studio. But this was na naive and misguided, and the studio offered him very low pay to be Dracula, knowing that he would jump at any chance, which he did. Belagosi was paid $500 a week to be Dracula. For contrast, David Manners, who plays John Harker in this movie, I'm sure you will agree, a very forgettable role, a very forgettable performance. David Manners, I'm sure, a perfectly lovely person, but the role is small and forgettable and the performance is weak. He was paid $2,000 a week, four times more than Bela Lugosi was. And I know the film history is not usually where I place my emphasis in these lectures. I just, it is a tragedy and a travesty how little Bela Lugosi was paid to be Dracula. And having been Dracula, he, during the filming of Dracula, said he would never play Dracula again. But he soon found that this is the role that he was known for. As David Skull says in the commentary of the DVD of this movie, Bela Lugosi looked like Dracula and he sounded like Dracula. That was his voice. He didn't use special makeup. And so, 
he, the role was so memorable. He only played Dracula one more time on screen in uh, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. And yet, uh, it was how... Certainly it was how producers saw him. Possibly audiences would have looked past it if he had been given the opportunity, but he wasn't. And it's a tragedy both of his, of some lack of business savvy, but also of a Hollywood system being very callous, being very manipulative, being very diminishing him p- partly because of his foreignness. And all this despite the fact that Universal Studios made a profit only one year of the Great Depression, and it was 1931 on the strength of Dracula and Frankenstein. And Dracula was a huge financial success, and it was a huge financial success because of Bela Lugosi. I think it's difficult to make any other argument. He is at the core of why this movie works. The other thing, while we're talking about this movie being steeped in tragedy, to shift away from Bela Lugosi for a moment, the movie's directed by Todd Browning, and you may have noticed when you watch the movie that the direction is, uh, it's a little inconsistent. Reportedly, Todd Browning, as director of this movie, didn't do very much. There's, uh, Helen Chandler, who plays Mina, is quoted as saying that people asked her what it was like to work with Todd Browning, and she said, I don't know. (laughs) She remembers him sitting in a chair all day while the filming went on, and the actual direction coming from Carl Freund. Carl Freund was a cinematographer and director. He was the cinematographer of Metropolis, which I mentioned in my Bride of Frankenstein video. And a lot of the most compelling shots of this movie we can credit to Carl Freund pretty safely. But the reason that Todd Browning, I mean, we don't can never know what Todd Browning was thinking and what was going on in his mind and all that speculation is fruitless. But since I'm digressing into film history, I'll tell you something about Todd Browning and the making of Dracula. And this digression begins with the producer, Carl Lemel Jr., Carl Lemel Jr. is behind the push towards horror. He was in his early 20s when this movie came out and had just barely taken over from his father as the head of Universal Studios. He wanted Lon Chaney to play Dracula because Lon Chaney was a proven moneymaker. Lon Chaney goes in a movie, the movie makes money. Lon Chaney had worked with Todd Browning. Todd Browning was Lon Chaney's director. And Lon Chaney didn't really want to do Dracula, but Universal persuaded him, offered him a three-picture deal, including a talky sequel to The Phantom of the Opera. And they persuaded Todd Browning, Lon Chaney's director, to come to Universal and direct Dracula. And after all these deals had been made, Lon Chaney developed throat cancer, and died. And Todd Browning was already in his contract to direct Dracula. And so they found a new Dracula, and eventually they found Bela Lugosi, and the story of how they did is... I've already touched on a little bit. He was essentially their last choice to play Dracula. But Todd Browning was uh, Lon Chaney's friend and director and collabor- long-time collaborator, and he came to this movie for Lon Chaney, who had just died of throat cancer. So it is... It seems to me clear that Todd Browning was in mourning during the direction of Dracula, that he was there on set, but he was being present on this set particularly... Like, he was already in mourning for his friend and being present on this set that Lon Chaney was supposed to have been the lead in would have been even more emotionally fraught. So Todd Browning didn't do much as the director of Dracula. One touch that definitely we can attribute to Todd Browning, though, is the armadillos. And there's another little story here, and I'm indulging myself by going into stories rather than analysis of the movie, but bear with me, please. Todd Browning made a movie with Lon Chaney, a vampire movie with Lon Chaney, called London After Midnight. 
in that movie, for some reason, Todd Browning uh, insisted on including armadillos. And the armadillos were shipped, and the armadillos for London After Midnight were shipped from Texas, but were packed together with rattlesnakes under the mistaken impression that the armadillo's armor would protect them against the rattlesnakes. And when the armadillos arrived, they they were not, uh, as, as David Skull says in the book that I'm getting this from, they were in no condition to act. So that's a horrible story, but apparently Todd Browning wanted a second chance at armadillos in a vampire movie, and that's why there are armadillos in Castle Dracula at the beginning of this movie. And by the way, I don't know this for sure, but it seems to me that the armadillos at the beginning of the Wonder Woman, Woman movie are a reference to the armadillos at the beginning of this movie, that armadillos signify some kind of mysterious otherness for some reason. They are weird looking animals. But back to talking about uh, Bell Lugosi for another moment. All our talk about Bell Lugosi, and particularly my mention of how much more John Harker was paid, how much more David Manners was paid to be John Harker than Bell Lugosi was paid to be Dracula, leads me to a question, and a lot of the criticism of this movie refers to John Harker as the hero of the movie. That seems patently false. John Harker is not the hero of this movie. If this movie has a hero, it is Van Helsing. But there's confusion in a lot of the critical conversation about Dracula around the structure of the story. And when I say the structure of the story, I mean people talk about John Harker as the hero partly because Jonathan Harker is the arguably central protagonist of the book, and John Harker is the parallel role. Some critical accounts of 1931 Dracula refer to Renfield as the protagonist, which is not the same thing as hero. And why would Renfield be the protagonist? Because he's the first person we see. Uh, I said a second ago that Van Helsing is the hero, if there is one. What, what do all these terms mean, and what do they mean in the context of Dracula? I'm going to clarify those things. Hero is not the same thing as protagonist. And protagonist is not the same thing as main character. So the main character in a work of fiction is the simpl is possibly the simplest to define because it is the loosest definition. The main character is the character who has most of the time on screen or the most time on page. They are the main character, the character that the narrative gives most attention to. So the main character is something we can decide by minutes or lines or it's a it's an uh, a measure of quantity the hero of a story is a moral judgment the hero is the good guy the hero is the one who presumably the audience is meant to be rooting for but more specifically the hero as opposed to the villain is the one who is working to do good things However, we, the audience, we, the reader, you remember, Barthes, that the text is created by the reader, not by the author. So you decide who the hero is by deciding whose motives you morally approve of. And the villain is the character whose mo motives you morally disapprove of. Because you are creating, you as the reader are creating the text. The protagonist is neither the main character nor the hero necessarily, though they often overlap hero, protagonist, main character. But the protagonist is a structural role, not a moral role, and not a role defined by the quantity. The protagonist of a story is the character whose choices move the narrative forward. The protagonist wants something, makes active choices, and those choices cause the narrative to happen. And the antagonist has uh, diametrically opposed goals to the protagonist. 
So in a well-structured story, if the protagonist gets what they want, the antagonist doesn't. And there are, I say well-structured, there are complexities. There, you can have a story where both, where the resolution is that both the protagonist and the antagonist get what they want. Maybe they change what they want, all kinds of complicated nuances. But the central goal of the protagonist drives the narrative forward, and the central goal of the antagonist is to block the central goal of the protagonist. By that definition, who is the protagonist of this movie? The answer is pretty clearly Dracula. Dracula wants something. All the other characters, including Van Helsing, try to stop Dracula from getting what it is that he wants, and they're successful in the end of the movie. Mostly. But Dracula's the protagonist. Dracula's also probably the main character. I don't know if he has the most lines, but he certainly has the most time on screen. He's the titular character. Whether Dracula is the protagonist of the book is much more questionable. The book has a group protagonist. Uh, but the movie, Dracula... Bela Lugosi's Dracula is the protagonist of this movie. And it's one of the reasons that this movie makes people unsettled. And it's one of the reasons that this movie makes people unsettled, not just as audience members who feel that there's something upsetting about it. But critical accounts of Dracula have trouble making sense of Dracula the movie, have had trouble making sense of what is even happening in this movie. And they have trouble ac accounting for why it's successful. And a lot of the books and articles that I've read in preparation for this lecture skirt around why is Dracula a good movie? Is Dracula a good movie? And they say it isn't. And they say the Spanish language Dracula is better than the English language Dracula. And the cinematography of the Spanish language Dracula probably is better than the English language Dracula. Another little bit of film history dubbing technology was not good at this point and also was considered cheating and so to make a foreign version of this movie for the foreign market universal filmed a spanish language version Soy Dracula. at the same time as they filmed the english language version with a completely different cast and crew but the same sets and props and they would film the english language version during the day and the spanish language version at night they also, by the way, released a third version, a silent film version with dialogue cards, because some theaters didn't have the technology to make talkie movies yet. The thing that a lot of the critical accounts of Dracula seem not to notice is that Dracula himself is the protagonist, and that is unsettling for us as viewers. That is because it is contrary we, to what we anticipate. We expect the protagonist to be the hero. We expect to be rooting for the protagonist to achieve his goals. And because Dracula is the protagonist, the audience is unsure where to place our loyalty. We don't want him. We feel that he is evil. We don't want him to kill the characters, but we are so much more compelled by him. And he's structurally in the role of the character who has a goal. And we are accustomed to want the protagonist to achieve their goals. And we, as the audience, are then complicit in Dracula's invasion and Dracula's role here in the movie. And at the very same time as by, by virtue of Dracula's structural role as the protagonist, we are placed in a position of being complicit with him. We are also, as the viewer, to whom Dracula so often looks with his hypnotizing gaze. Think about how very often Bela Lugosi looks right at the camera lights right on his eyes, and the camera zooms slowly into his face. Bela Lugosi's Dracula has the power of hypnotism. He has the power of hypnotism that's connected to his physical presence. Unlike in the book Dracula, where Dracula hypnotizes over distances, Bela Lugosi's Dracula is there, stares people in the eye, and that hypnotizes them. And then think about how often he stares metaphorically into our eyes by staring into the camera. He hypnotizes us, the viewers, and every time that the camera zooms slowly towards his face, we are symbolically being drawn into Dracula, drawn into his thrall, drawn into his control, 
drawn into his charisma, which comes back again to this movie only works if your Dracula has that kind of personal magnetism, that kind of charisma that we plausibly feel drawn into him, which I think Bela Lugosi does. Let's talk a little bit about one of the other things about 1931 Dracula that is, I think, by any measure successful. And that is the atmosphere, especially of the first half of the movie. Just like with Bram Stoker's novel, this movie succeeds on atmosphere in a way that it doesn't necessarily succeed in plot terms, in terms of character depth, in terms of... In a lot of aspects of the movie, we can recognize technical failings. But the atmosphere is so successful, and that's partly due to Bela Lugosi's personal charisma, but it's also there are aspects of the atmosphere that are extremely effective that carry us through the movie. The atmosphere in a work of fiction, a novel, or a movie is the emotional context created by various aspects of the of the work, so the setting, but the also the lighting, but also the soundscape, but also the acting, all of that creates an emotional context. And the emotional context is what we refer to when we talk about atmosphere. And one of the things that contributes to the successful atmosphere of Dracula is the symbolic richness. That's partly brought in from the novel. And if you took my course on the novel Dracula, you'll know that Dracula as a book, Dracula as a character, is full of symbolic richness. It's There are levels and levels of levels of meaning and interpretation that we can find in what blood means, what a vampire is, what a vampire's bite is. And we can see a lot of those same levels of symbolic richness in the movie, some of which, as I said, are brought in from the book. Vampires always symbolize death and fear of death, and fear of being denied that death. And Dracula, not all vampires, but Dracula, because of his association with crucifixes, strengthens the religious allegory and the religious symbolism of vampire stories. And so look at the way in this movie, as he does in the book, Dracula feeds Jonathan with wine, the setup here in the scene where Jonathan Harker first arrives at Dracula's castle, the table is like an altar, he's served bread and wine, this is an image of communion, and then what Dracula does, what a vampire does, is feed on its victims, feed on their blood, in a reverse imagery of Christian communion. All of that kind of comes already loaded into what a vampire is. And then the movie visually adds more and more layers. Like the way that Dracula's castle looks like a crumbling church. And the way that Dracula's house, Carfax, in the novel, Carfax is just a house. But here we are told that it is... Carfax Abbey. Carfax Abbey. Carfax Abbey. Now that's partly some confusion of setting. You will you may have noticed... If you're a geographically inclined person, you may have noticed that this uh, Dr. Seward is a doctor of at Whitby, which is just outside London, according to this movie. And Dracula has bought Carfax Abbey. In the book, Whitby Abbey is where a lot of the plot happens. Whitby is a long way from London. Later on, the wolves are howling and... Uh, And Seward says he wouldn't expect to see wolves so close to London, but if if his asylum is in Whitby, that is not at all close to London. At all. So, the locations are all contracted in the movie from the book. But that adds an extra meaning, because Whitby Abbey, a crumbling abbey, and the, the ruin of the abbey reminds Dracula of the ruin of his castle, that adds an extra religious subtext to the movie and also adds a subtext of religion in the movie being represented as crumbling. 
in the book, the heroes are, especially at the end of the story, driven and sustained by their faith. Not in the movie. The crucifix drives Dracula away because he is religiously oriented, but Van Helsing and Mina in this movie are not motivated by an intense Christian faith the way that they are in Dracula. So there's a symbolic meaning of religion as crumbling in this movie. And then we can see a symbolic context of class and money, and I already alluded a little bit to this, but look at this where Dracula is walking around, walking along the streets in a top hat. Famously, Dracula's clothes are aristocratic. He's wearing a cape. Why is he wearing a cape? The cape originates on the stage production where it was used to hide a trap door so it could seem like Dracula was disappearing. But a cape is also a marker of aristocratic upper class sophistication. And we see this scene where Dracula preys on the flower girl. What is that why is that in this movie? That's not taken from the book, and it doesn't seem plot-wise to add anything to the movie. But in terms of atmosphere and symbolically, it adds a lot to the movie, because remember, this movie is coming out in 1931, the very beginning of the Great Depression, not the very beginning, early in the Great Depression, and the distinction in American society between haves and have-nots, between upper class and lower class, is perhaps never more strongly felt in their history, except maybe today. And so we have Dracula coded as wealthy upper class, preying on and uh, feeding on and preying on a flower girl coded as poor lower class and leaving her body in the street. Throughout this movie, unlike in the book, Dracula is moving around in the society of upper class London. He goes to the theater. He goes to the opera. He has the social capital that comes with his material capital. And in the context of the Great Depression, that has a very specific flavor. Because we have here an upper-class wealthy character who is not an object of envy, but is an object of fear. And like the Great Depression... Dracula moves silently towards the camera and pulls us, the viewers, in and threatens to take everything from us. So at the same exact same time, again, as I said earlier, we are at exactly the same time we are associating ourselves with Dracula and with his victims. We are never associating ourselves with Van Helsing. We are not seeing the world through Van Helsing's eyes we're sort of seeing the world through Mina's eyes, but mostly Dracula is attacking us directly by looking directly at the camera, and symbolically Dracula as an aristocratic, wealthy figure threatens to drain the audience symbolically of money as well as of blood and life. And here maybe we can remember that Dracula the fictional character and Dracula the movie did drain Bella Lugosi, the actor, and Dwight Fry, the actor, and most of the people involved in this movie. But especially Dwight Fry and Bella Lugosi, the two most dramatically successful performers in this movie, both are drained by the movie, drained by their roles, of their life, of their resources, both are typecast from here on. Dwight Fry is going to be in Frankenstein, which comes out later the same year. He'll play the hunchback Fritz. Uh, and the two movies back to back where he plays manic, wild, mad characters, those are going to typecast him for the rest of his career. 
Which is a shame, because you can see even in Dracula that he has quite a lot more versatility than that. Let's talk a little bit about silence in this movie. You will, I am sure, have noticed that Dracula doesn't have a soundtrack. There's a little bit of music from uh, Swan Lake at the very beginning. And when they're at the theater, at the symphony, wherever it is that they are, they're in an opera box. There's music that is meant to be physically present. There are actual musicians within the, I mean, it's the technical term is, is it's diegetic. It exists, the characters hear it. There's not a soundtrack for this movie. There was debate in the early days of sound movies, of talkies. There was some concern that audiences wouldn't understand where the music was coming from if it wasn't coming from a diegetic source on camera. So we can see... So a lot of this movie is actually silent. And whether that's... Whether that was uh, because the filmmakers didn't understand what audiences would accept, or whether it was an atmospheric choice, is less important than the result that it has. Remember, the reader creates the text, the author doesn't. The reader is the author of the text, the writer isn't. So, what Todd Browning and Carl Freund had in mind is less important than the effect that they produce. This moment, when Dracula and his, the female vampire, one of his three brides, and a little beetle emerge from their coffins. Side note, what is going on with the beetle emerging from a sarcophagus? I'm not sure. It is uh, simultaneously hilarious and extremely unnerving. Is that an undead beetle? It has a little cough in its own size. Okay, let me carry on with my point. This moment is a lot of the atmosphere produced by it is effective because of the silence. And we should remember that theater goers at this time, I mean, frankly, as now, are not used to silence in a movie. We talk about silent films, but silent films would have an accompanying score. It would have either a live performer playing the organ or whatever, or sometimes a pre-recorded score that wasn't synced up strictly, but you wouldn't watch a silent film in silence. For a lot of moviegoers in 1931, it's extremely plausible that this is their first experience of real silence in a movie. And that adds to how unnerving and unsettling and uncanny this scene is. There are other moments of silence later in the movie that are less atmospherically effective, but this beginning, near the beginning, this introduction to Dracula in silence is so pregnant with atmosphere and meaning and malevolence and uncanniness. It carries through the rest of the movie. I have two other questions about this movie to which I am not sure I have satisfying answers. Both of these questions, there are at least two answers. I have one answer to both of them, and it's an obvious and simple answer, and then there's, I think, a more profound answer that I am not sure of. I stop being cagey and say what the questions are. One, why does so much of the action of this movie happen off screen? And the simple answer to that is it's about budget. This movie is a low-budget movie made during the Great Depression. Producer Carl Lamel wanted a big, super-production, lavish, special-effect-laden movie, but the financial situation of Universal at the time just made that untenable. And Dracula ended up making a profit, but it was a hard sell to the studio, Carl Lemmel was the CEO of the studio, so it was a hard sell to himself. But it was a hard... It did not seem likely 
as a money-making movie because studios were concerned that audiences would be squeamish. It was the first fantasy talkie ever made. And there was a lot of concern that moviegoers didn't want something that had actual supernatural elements in it. Would that have any audience? And that it was too horrible and grotesque and frightening. So for all of those reasons, the studio was reluctant to spend money on it and didn't really have the money even if they were enthusiastic about it. So it was a small budget movie. Connected to that, it's based off of a small budget play. That's not entirely a coincidence. In fact, the one happened first. They decided to make a small budget movie. That's when they chose to adapt the play rather than write a new screenplay. But the play, everything about the play was designed to run a play on a shoestring budget. So it is framed, it is structured as a drawing room mystery, the play. The little scene at the beginning where Renfield goes to Transylvania, that wasn't in the play. The play is almost entirely set in the room, in Seward's room. And it's staged as a mystery where Seward and uh, Van Helsing solve the mystery of what's happening to Mina. And so when the movie starts to feel like it's just in a room and people are having these conversations, well, that's what the play was like. And so the play is staged very much that a lot of the supernatural things get described. They happen off screen. We don't ever go into Mina's bedroom. We don't ever go into the site of the attacks. We hear about them. And the movie picked up on that deliberately as a budget-saving measure. Even, for example, even when John Harker and Mina are sitting out on the porch talking about the beautiful stars, we don't see the stars. Look, the fog's lifting. See how plain you can see the stars. We're just told about them. We don't see the vampire bite. We never see Dracula's fangs. We never see Dracula transform. We hear about a wolf running a cross the lawn but we don't see it we hear about dracula turning in uh summoning rats for renfield but we don't see it all of that part of the answer of why is budget as i said but that's only half of an answer that's only part of an answer because an unsatisfying movie would not have lasted would not have made the uh would not have been the financial success that it was. Despite almost everything exciting happening off screen, the movie is still successful. And I say successful both artistically and also financially, and I will argue that the financial success is evidence of some kind of artistic success. That is, it appeals to its readers create a text that they want to engage with. And I think that like the silence, the way that the majority of the interesting action happens off screen ends up creating an atmosphere that's both mysterious and claustrophobic that contributes to the effectiveness of the movie. Because it means that Bela Lugosi's charisma dominates the movie even more than it would otherwise. And that's not to say that if they'd shown a wolf running across the field, it would have diminished the movie. But it comes back to what I have said before, that the movie succeeds on the strength of Bela Lugosi's personal magnetism and charisma. And the most interesting things happen off screen? Well, no, actually, because the most interesting things are Bela Lugosi, is Dracula, and he is present on screen. And that's all he needs to be. That's all he needs to do is be on screen. The other related question, speaking of things that happen off screen, what do we make of the ending of this movie? And by the ending of the movie, I mean Van Helsing stakes Dracula off screen. Van Helsing is off sc- is on screen for part of it, but Dracula never is. We hear Dracula groaning. 
to indicate that he is dying. But the very end of the movie is even more perplexing. Jonathan, not Jonathan in the movie, John and Mina walk slowly up the stairs as Mina is rescued from Dracula, and Van Helsing remains below. He says, I'll catch up, I'll be there soon. Why? What is Van Helsing doing? What kind of an ending is this? Aren't you coming with us? Not yet. Uh, Presently. Uh, Come, John. They walk away. Van Helsing remains below, says he has something more to do. What is it? It seems the most anticlimactic ending possible. And this also has part of an answer that is only part of an answer. In the original airing of the film, Van Helsing or rather Edward Van Sloan, who plays Van Helsing, steps out from behind the curtain as the movie ends and speaks directly to the audience. So he breaks the fourth wall, speaks directly to the audience, says, Just a moment, gentlemen, just a word before you go. We hope the memories of Dracula won't give you bad dreams. So just a word of reassurance. When you get home tonight and the lights are turned out, and you're afraid to look behind the curtains, and you dread to see a face appear at the window. Well, just pull yourself together and remember, after all, there are such things. Now, it makes some more sense of the ending of the movie if Mina and John walk off stage The curtain closes and Van Helsing has remained below so that he can step out of the movie and talk directly to the audience about how Dracula is real. And in fact, that keeps a good deal of the tone of the book as well, which also has a note at the beginning to the effect that the papers that you're about to read are all collected from real life. But again, that is only partly an answer because what was originally intended isn't what is on screen. And this uh, epilogue is mostly lost, is not included in any performance of Dracula and in, in the DVD of Dracula. Early in the screening in theaters, it was lost, partly because the censors thought it was too frightening and uh, counter to the religious understanding by suggesting that supernatural evil really existed. You may remember, by the way, that Edward Van Sloan, the same actor, has a preamble that he says directly to the audience at the beginning of Frankenstein. Just a word of friendly warning. So he they, he's also in that movie as a different character. Um... So that's part of an answer, but it's only part of an answer, as I said, because it doesn't happen. So we don't have, I think, the luxury to explain and analyze a possible alternate version of the movie. We have the movie that we actually have. And what do we make of the ending that we actually have as it actually is? And I think one of the effects of the ending as it currently stands is exactly that it is anticlimactic, is exactly that it is coming right back to what Jeffrey Weinstock said that I quoted near the beginning of this video, that the vampire always returns. The vampire always escapes, and this open-ended conclusion to the movie, where Van Helsing, the one who killed Dracula, remains below with dre- with the earth and the coffins after Mina has escaped. Why? It casts doubt into Van Helsing's character, and it casts doubt into the finality of the finale. In the book, I've mentioned some people reading the book, If again, if you took my course on Dracula, and if you haven't taken my course on Dracula, may I recommend it? Um, in the book... There are critics and readers who suspect some members of the team that fights Dracula of being secretly on Dracula's side. And there's a suggestion here at the end of the movie that Van Helsing is not all he appears to be, 
that the conclusion is not as neat as it appears to be, that John and Mina have escaped, but so potentially has Dracula, because Van Helsing remains with Dracula. And let me end there. If you have comments or questions, things you want to say about this video, this lecture, this movie, you can of course comment below. You can email me paul at clockworksacademy.com. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Moffat. If you like what I did in this video and you would like something more, more in-depth and more grounded in my actual expertise. When I do these videos, these bonus videos about movies, I read a lot about the movie and I watch the movie, but this is not my academic wheelhouse. If you would like to do something in my academic wheelhouse where I really am more expert, come to Clockworks Academy and take my Dracula course. We will spend eight weeks reading Bram Stoker's Dracula in a lot of depth. There is a new section of that course beginning at the end of June, the beginning of July, that'll go for eight weeks. You can find that at clockworksacademy.com. I also have a course beginning at the same time about werewolves and werewolf stories in the Middle Ages. That is going to be an absolutely fascinating course. Uh, you can join. You still have time to sign up and join either of those courses or both of them if you really felt like it. And I have more courses coming, one on Beowulf and one on zombies, and uh, I have done one on Frankenstein that will begin again. Depending on when you're watching this video, those may be coming very soon or they may be coming a long time in the future, but you will find more information at clockworksacademy.com. Thank you very much for joining me. I've been Dr. Paul Moffat. Goodbye. <laughs>